Good morning and welcome. It's great that you could join us for our online service this Sunday morning. We're continuing through the letter to the Romans this morning and uh, we, we, we reach a, a, a difficult passage this morning, pastorally difficult. Um, but do you know, at, at Lostock Church and at Dean Church, we do not shy away from teaching even the more difficult parts of the Bible, even those parts of the Bible that are a bit more difficult to hear. We teach the whole counsel of God, the whole of the Bible, and it's right and proper that we do that. But before we get to the sermon later on and, and uh, anything else in this service, I'm going to read to you from Psalm 100 and then I'll pray for us. And Psalm 100 says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let me pray for us. We do indeed uh, shout for joy to you, Lord, this morning. We worship you and we, we come before you with joyful songs. Please uh, prepare our hearts for the uh, reading and teaching of your word this morning. And Lord, please help us uh, to hear and to be obedient to your word. And please equip us to live for you in this world. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you. 
Today's reading comes from Romans chapter 1, verse 24 to 32. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie 
and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their woman exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do you have someone in your life, someone who you trust, who tells you how things really are? Someone who has the courage to tell you what you may not want to hear? Perhaps when you're struggling to make that next big decision. Someone who prays for you. Someone who speaks truth to you in love and grace. Someone who affirms you when you're doing good and appropriately challenges you when you're veering off course and about to get yourself into a mess. I remember when I was in my early days as an ordained minister. There was a member of the congregation at that church where I worked who was hugely supportive and encouraging and as part of that had the courage to tell me when I was getting things wrong. I'm so grateful to God for that person. And I would seriously listen to that person because I know that they prayed for me and had my and the wider church's best interests at heart. Already in Paul's letter to the Romans, we've seen how Paul really loves these Christians. We've seen how he longs to see them and share with them. We've seen how he constantly prays for them. And it's out of that love and care for them that he's able to be upfront with them about how things really are. Last Sunday, Ben was helping us think about verses 18 to 23, where Paul begins to unwrap the ugly truth of how things are in God's awesome yet spoiled creation. And sadly, how even us humans made in God's image to be in special relationship with him, made to enjoy perfect fellowship with God, made to know life in all its fullness in Christ, even us humans are under the influence of the badness that is in the world. Verse 21, their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 22, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. People even ignore God and choose instead to replace the worship of God with other things. Now, in verse 25, Paul gets to the root of that problem. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. As with so many aspects of Christian teaching, this is rooted in Genesis chapters 1 to 3. The first humans, Adam and Eve, had everything that they needed. They had paradise and unbroken fellowship with God. 
But when tempted by Satan, they chose to believe the lie rather than the promises of their loving God who provided abundantly for them. And as soon as they did that, everything else went wrong. And most crucially, their relationship with God was wrecked. And that's what we humans have been doing ever since. We have this tendency to, to listen to, even clamour after, the lies of the devil and of the world. A world that has largely turned its back on God. Instead of trusting in God's truth and in his wonderful promises. The devil is an old hand at getting us to question God's word. Remember the first things Satan said to those first humans. Did God really say? <laughs> so before we go any further, we need to decide about how we regard God's word. Firstly, are we convinced that God really knows what is best for us? Secondly, are we convinced that the Bible is God speaking to us? When we read the Bible, that we are actually hearing the voice of our loving creator God. Thirdly, are we going to trust God and to seek to live according to his word? Or are we going to ignore truth and live our life our own way? These are fundamental questions that we need to be clear about. If we're iffy on these questions, if for you the Bible is not your chief source of authority, then you're really going to struggle with many things that the Bible says, including what the Bible says on some big life and church issues, which Paul goes on to address in the rest of his letter to the Romans. But going back to my opening questions, do you have someone in your life, someone who you trust, who tells you how things really are? Someone who has the courage to tell you what you may not want to hear, perhaps when you're struggling to make that next big decision. Someone who prays for you. Someone who speaks truth to you in love and grace. Someone who affirms you when you're doing good and appropriately challenges you when you're veering off course and about to get yourself into a mess? The answer is, yes, you do have that person in your life. If you want that person in your life, that person is the God who speaks to you through the Bible, who loves you so very much who wants the very best for you. Truth, however, can be hard to hear, however lovingly it's given. People having their portrait painted tend to want the painter to miss out any blemishes, to paint a rather more glamorous version of themselves. Oliver Cromwell uh, is said to have instructed his portrait painter to include in the painting, quote, all these roughness, pimples, warts and everything as you see me, otherwise I will never pay a farthing for it. I, I, I don't know if Cromwell was pleased with the finished painting. It survived, so I guess that he was. And that's what we get in Romans 1 to 3. God, through the Apostle Paul, is telling us the brutal truth about the human condition. Not how a portrait painter sees us, but how God sees us. And we can't hide anything from God. 
Now, don't get too depressed. There are tons of good news to come in Romans and a bunch of practical help and encouragement for living as a Christian in this world. Chapter 3, verse 21, in a few weeks' time, is the turning point. But here in chapter 1, verses 24 to 32, Paul mentions some of the ways in which we humans have gone tragically wrong. Ways in which we as individuals and as society have become broken and a long way from where God would have us be. In verses 24 to 27, Paul focuses in on issues of human sexuality. In verses 28 to 32, he lists a number of other ways in which us humans fall far short of how God would have us live. The root cause of all this is our rebellion against God. That's what sin is, rebellion against God. Sin isn't wrongdoing, our sins are the wrongdoings, and our sins, our sinful actions, stem from our sin, from our rebellion against God. Paul has already explained in verses 18 to 24 that we humans willfully rebel against God. We even think that we're wise for doing so when actually we're foolish, verse 22. Now, in verses 24 to 32, Paul tells us how God has responded to our rebellion. Therefore, verse 24, because of this, verse 26, since, verse 28, rebellion against God, sin, has consequences. Verse 24, God gave them up. Verse 26, God gave them up. Verse 28, God gave them up. What does that mean, God gave them up? As a consequence of God's perfect righteous, just, settled judgment upon us rebellious humans. He has handed us over to our sinfulness. He's handed us over to impurity, verse 24, to wanting uh, what is contrary to nature, verse 26, to being unable to even think rightly, verse 28, to, to have a debased mind. Every thought that goes through our brains is tainted by sin, by rebelliousness against God. And the sins that Paul lists here, sexual immorality, envy, murder, maliciousness, etc, 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 are the symptoms of us being handed over to sinfulness. They are signs of God's judgment and wrath, verse 18, upon us rebellious human beings. But why does Paul particularly focus in on sexual sin? And why does he especially focus in on this area of human life where we exchange the truth of God for a lie? And he particularly mentions homosexuality. Well, the answer is back in Genesis, in God's creation order in how things were before we humans first rebelled against our loving creator God. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. There is something rather beautiful in the fact that we are being made in God's image and that that not only means we're created to be in relationship with God but that there are two complementary genders and then in Genesis chapter 2 verses 23 to 25 the man said this is this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman for she was taken out of man that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. 
Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. So marriage and sexual intimacy were established. Marriage and sexual intimacy between one man and one woman, a beautiful and blessed thing, which is the only God-given place where sexual intimacy should occur. So bouncing back into Romans chapter one, it's hardly surprising that Paul mentions homosexual practice since it is one of the more obvious ways in which people reject God's creation order. Now, I'm not unaware of how sensitive and how deeply personal these issues are, particularly for those who are Christians and who experience same-sex attraction and who perhaps are in same-sex relationships. I wish I had more time this morning to speak into the pastoral implications of what the Bible teaches us here, but I, I don't. But also, I'm not going to soft pedal what the Bible teaches, from Genesis to Romans and beyond, about sexuality and gender and about sexual sin. Notice that there is a very significant distinction between same-sex attraction and same-sex sexual intimacy or homosexual practice. Our sinfulness pulls us in various ungodly directions, but that does not mean that we have to go in those directions. Paul says to young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, for the Spirit of God for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love and self-discipline. Because a person is same sex or opposite sex attracted, it does not mean that the person must act on those feelings. Jesus Christ was fully human and the most fulfilled human who has ever lived. He was tempted to sin, just as we are, but he lived his life God's way. And there's our model. And God enables us to do this by giving us his word, by giving us his spirit, and by giving us fellowship and prayerful support through our church family. If we're plugged into a biblically minded church family, that is. You know, it's commonly expressed today that Jesus never spoke out against homosexual practice. Well, we don't know that. We only know what we have in the Gospel accounts. The Gospels don't record Jesus speaking directly against sexual exploitation, or against neglecting the elderly, or against child sacrifice. That doesn't mean he approved of those things. And anyway, he didn't need to speak out against homosexual practice since no first century Jew would question whether homosexual practice was permissible. They knew that it wasn't. Every Old Testament text that deals with sexuality, sexuality assumes that the only appropriate place for sexual intimacy is within heterosexual marriage and homosexual activity is always spoken of negatively. When Jesus is teaching on divorce he refers to Genesis chapter 2 as the blueprint for sexual relationships. God's creation order is the pattern. And to say that Jesus never spoke about homosexuality is saying that the words or lack of words of Jesus somehow carry more weight than the rest of God's words in the Bible, which is a wrong understanding of scripture. The whole of Bible of the Bible is God's word. Over the centuries, those who have experienced and expressed same-sex attraction have often been ignored or even vilified by churches and we Christians need to repent of and desist from treating anyone like that. 
Jesus loved and welcomed all, and that is our model. Jesus also spoke truth to people, calling all those who would follow him to leave their lives of sin. So one challenge for any church is how to welcome and love the sinner without endorsing the sin. We can't just pretend that sinful behaviour or lifestyle, including sexual sin, doesn't matter. Some churches, some Christians are so keen to welcome that they can neglect to speak of sin. Some churches, some clergy, don't even accept that homosexual practice or other sexual activity outside of a biblical understanding of marriage is sinful. So, of course, they're not likely to help people to understand what God says in the Bible about these things. We are all sinners in need of God's saving grace. And as God's people, we should be the most gracious people on earth. We're all broken and hurt and struggling with temptations. And the great news is that Jesus came to rescue us from God's wrath and from being given over to our sinful nature. But to benefit from that, we need to turn from sin and to seek to live with Jesus Christ. Not just as our saviour, but as our Lord, which means trying our best to live under his lordship. So these matters are personal, but they also impinge on wider church life. In November last year, the Church of England launched a range of resources based on a, a big report called Living in Love and Faith, LLF. It's the latest Church of England report over the years to address issues in human sexuality. I've not finished reading the report yet, I'm part way through. It runs to 482 pages and it's quite dense. There's a significant movement within the Church of England these days to move our denomination away from a biblical position on sexual ethics and to embrace the way of the world. There are pressures on bishops and on General Synod, the governing body of the Church of England, to redefine marriage and to call that which is sin good and pleasing to God. We need to pray that this movement does not get its way and that the authority of God's word would prevail within the Church of England. But what about us? Is our understanding of sexual ethics defined by what we see on the television or by what God says in the Bible? Or, and this is the really challenging thing here, when a friend or family member speaks to you of their same-sex attraction and how they found love and happiness in a homosexual relationship, does their story define your sexual ethics? And what about your feelings? Do your sexual feelings, however strong, define your sexual ethics above and beyond what the Bible teaches? Remember, we've been given over to our sinful natures. We've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. We all do it. But God has given to every Christian his spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. He empowers us to resist temptation and to live God's way. We are born again as children of God when we become a Christian. And we are defined by that, not by our sexuality or how others define us. By God's grace, we can live God's way. Now, we all get it wrong. We all, we all do, whether it's about sexuality or in some other area of life. But we must keep coming back to God and the way he wants us to live our life. And to fail to do so is saying that we don't really trust God with the future. 
We don't really trust that God will provide us with everything that we need, physically, emotionally and spiritually. If anything that I've said just now causes you pain or adds to your heartache, that was not my intention. My desire and prayer for you is that you know the goodness and joyful fellowship of God at every point in your life. There are many other aspects of the Bible and human sexuality that I could have developed, but we don't have the time to do that here. This talk is already, I think, a bit longer than I would normally speak for. Can I, however, recommend three excellent resources from other people? One of them is this book, The Plausibility Problem by Ed Shaw. In The Plausibility Problem, Ed, who himself experiences same-sex attraction, seeks to show us how the Bible can seem unreasonable, not because of what it says about sexuality, but because of missteps that we can make about our understanding of the Christian life. Another book is this, A Better Story by Glyn Harrison. A Better Story is a critique of the so-called sexual revolution and a presentation of the far superior biblical vision of sex and relationships. And the third resource I'd recommend is a website, livingout.org, livingout.org. And this website has helpful stuff for those experiencing same-sex attraction, for their friends, for families and for churches. And of course, do make contact with me or someone else on the pastoral team if you'd like to talk about any issues raised here or if you'd simply value having someone pray for you. Now in a moment, I'm going to play a three and a half minute video clip. It's a testimony from um, the Living Out uh, website and it particularly highlights the role of the church family. But before I do that, let me pray for you. Father, thank you that you have created us in your image to be in right relationship with you and with others. Help us to appreciate that the world is under judgment and that we've been given over to sinfulness, but that in Christ there is hope, there is a way out, there is new identity and new life and new meaning. Help us, Lord, whatever our sexuality, not to be defined by it. Help us supremely to know who we are in Christ and to enjoy that above all else. Lord, we need you every minute of every day to enable us to live for you in this life, in this world. Father, help each one of us to embrace the better story which your word reveals. Amen. My name's Anne. I grew up in Manchester and I did a degree at University College London. I now live in Newcastle. I work with students and in my spare time I like taking photographs and riding on steam trains. <laughs> I kind of always, I always thought I was gay right from a young age. I can't remember a time where I wasn't aware of being gay really. Um, I was quite a tomboy when I was younger. I remember when I was five years old at my um, party and all my little friends had their party dresses on and I had a tracksuit and a motorbike helmet on <laughs> and I only lifted the visor to eat my cake. I became a Christian in my first year at university studying philosophy. I'd seen university as a chance to make a new life for myself and I thought I would throw myself into the LGBT because I wanted to be open about my sexuality and I did feel like I was with a group of people who understood me and I felt like I belonged but I still felt like there was something missing and I was still searching for meaning and truth in my life. There was a girl in my halls that went to church so I went along to church with her 
and I was really struck by the fact that they seemed to really believe what they were talking about. They seemed to, their faith seemed to make a real difference in their life. After one of the services, there was a student slot, and um, a guy came along to talk who, who was actually from a gay background, and he'd become a Christian, and he was telling his story. And it was amazing because it's the first time that I thought, oh, okay, God loves gay people. Um, and so I was very inspired by him, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe God would like me as well. At first, I think I found it very hard to accept the biblical teaching about sexuality, and it seemed very unfair that God would prevent me from having a relationship and I was I was torn really because I wanted to be obedient to God but I found it really really hard and I think I found it hard because I didn't fundamentally trust that he had my best interests at heart. It was a very much gritted teeth obedience for a lot of years I think and that it isn't always easy to sustain that and so I didn't. <laughs> it, um, yeah there were a couple of times where um, you know, I just I just found it too hard to live like that, even though that's what I, you know, wanted to live in a way that pleased God. But I, ju I just found it practically really difficult in my early Christian life. But I'm in a different place now. When I'd taken a sort of wrong turn in my Christian life and um, I'd got involved in in a relationship, I think some of the things that helped me get back on my feet were being in a really supportive church context. I actually never stopped going to church, and I think. I'm so glad that that was the case because I think it, you know it's it's hard to be a Christian anyway but being a Christian by yourself without people encouraging you and without you know being in community is almost impossible. I always sort of left myself open to being challenged and kind of working this through with other people and I was very open with my minister and he gave me grace and space to to work things through. It's a bit like when you're learning to play the piano, your teacher doesn't throw you out if you've hit a bad note. They help you to <laughs> hit the right notes and it was a bit like that. I think as a single person, um, it's it's still really possible to have the intimacy and the, the love that you need. I think it comes from um, really good friendships and, and being in community. I do think that you know sharing my house and sharing my life with people has really transformed the way that I live and it means that I'm getting healthy physical touch, I'm getting healthy intimacy, I've got people to talk to when I need to wrestle with something or I just want some advice or I just need to cry or whatever. And actually the people that I work with um, are also really close friends. Living with a friend's great because it's, it's all about sharing life so you know when I get home some Sometimes Abby's like cooked me a delicious casserole. We share a car, so it, a lot of it's like sharing financial costs and things. But sharing life as well, going on trips, going on holidays, and just having someone there when you get in and you want to talk about your day. Somebody who's actually going to ask you and take an interest is huge. If I was asked to give advice to somebody um, who's same-sex attracted uh, and a Christian, I would say put Jesus first, um, love him with all your heart and soul and mind, because. It's totally worth it. Whatever you give up for him, it is totally worth it.
please do join me in saying this prayer of confession. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have wandered and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But you, O Lord, have mercy upon us sinners. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent, according to your promises declared to mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live a disciplined, righteous and godly life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Father, we know that you love and care for us, but we come before you in sadness this morning. Now our country has reached over a 100,000 deaths from COVID. Lord, we pray for all those who have lost loved ones in this horrendous pandemic. Ease the pain in their hearts and give us all hope in the very difficult times we face at present. Father, we are so grateful for the COVID vaccine. So please give us patience as we wait in hope for that and eventually a route to more freedom in our lives and some relief from our worries and uncertainties. A time when we can hug our loved ones without fear and rejoice, O oh Lord, in this freedom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. prayer. This Tuesday will be Candlemas when we remember Jesus' presentation at the temple. So we give special thanks today for you, Jesus, the light of our world. As snowdrops, also known as Candlemas bells, show the first promise of spring to come, we rejoice in the light and life which only you can bring into our lives. In these strange, often lonely times, we pray for new beginnings and a new life. We now see more clearly than ever our need of your presence. Lord, we call out to you by name, Emmanuel, God with us, and we celebrate every single day that you never leave our side. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for the recovery of the great number of people who are battling with COVID and for all who are caring for them at home or in hospital. We pray for all doctors and nurses that you will give them strength to continue in their work of saving lives and that enough hospital beds will be found for the very sick who really need them. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for all those people overseas still facing all their other troubles of poverty, conflict and oppression while also struggling to cope with the COVID pandemic. We give thanks too for people in our own country providing love and care, health workers, people visiting the lonely, those volunteering for food banks and so many others. Please Lord, give them the strength to continue their magnificent work. Lord, in your mercy, Hear, Hear our, our prayer. prayer. We think of all others who are suffering mental or physical illness today 
and for those who were unable to access the help they needed this time. Comfort them, Lord, and ease their burdens. Give them your peace to calm their troubled minds. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. As January draws to a close, we are already struggling, Lord, to keep our New Year resolutions to live better lives and care more for our neighbours. So we ask for your guidance as we face new challenges. Please help us, Lord, to see that we are not in charge and to hold our plans a little more loosely. Even welcoming apparent interruptions and setbacks as signs from you that we should look afresh at our priorities. Please let us also be a little gentler on ourselves and others, remembering that you love us just as we are, with all our faults. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Knowing you
As we come to the end of our service this morning, let me end in prayer. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.